Hi, I'm Joe Walensky, and I'm the program manager for Convey UX, which is Seattle's annual user experience conference. And that's coming up March 11th, 12th, and 13th. It's already the seventh annual year that we're doing it. So we're excited again. We have a great list of uh, presenters, and I get a chance to talk with them uh, in these previews. And today I'm talking with David Evans. Hello, David. How is it going? It's going great. It's going great, Joe. Well, I, I'm speaking from the uh, downtown Seattle offices of Blink UX. Where are you at? I'm out here in the woods in Redmond on the Microsoft campus. Well, uh, we're going to talk about your session uh, at the conference, but first, uh, why don't we find out a little bit uh, about you, maybe talk a little bit about uh, your background and what kinds of things you have going on at Microsoft and other areas. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, um, I, I, I always sort of lead by thinking of myself first as a psychologist, and I'm really committed to that particular form of nerdiness um, because I still think that's super meaningful to me in the work that I do uh, and, the, and the stakeholders that I've worked with. So for about 15 years, I've really been a hybrid UX and customer researcher. I really like to thrive in the areas where those two intersect which is when we're doing ethnographies, you know, and trying to really understand a, a new user type. So some of the work I uh, was really involved in last year at Microsoft involved identifying those first line workers, the ones that weren't traditionally sitting at a PC um, as part of their job, and then um, also doing a lot of work on what the future of work will actually look like. So we were doing some, some of this normative futurism uh, and then also um, trying to understand how mixed reality can be a part of that. So one of the fun parts about last year was it wasn't all just confidential proprietary research, but a lot of this ended up in white papers uh, with Harvard Business Review and Forbes and some of the stuff that Microsoft was issuing itself. Uh, you didn't uh, happen to mention your book, uh, Bottlenecks Aligning UX Design with User Psychology. Uh, um, what was that all about and uh, what was it like putting that together? Yeah, so uh, it came out, it'll be, it'll be like the second anniversary when Convey comes around, which by the way, I've attended three times now and I absolutely adore. We are so lucky to have that giant conference here in Seattle. Um, but yeah, uh, really it was my effort, uh, having done so much proprietary research to go back to the theoretical psychological roots that were part of my education and say, look, um, you know, all of this is, is really applicable here. That's an uncontroversial stance to take. You know, that, that the stuff that, you know, my stakeholders, UX designers, product managers, product marketers make, they're subject to those constrictions that people have in attention, perception, memory motivation, their own self-image, and, and the social dynamics of it. And you either survive those, those bottlenecks or you don't. And so it was just part of my customer obsession and also in some ways just my client service, you know, to say, look, before we even run a study or before you even start writing or designing, know these, these fundamental aspects of human nature just so that you're, 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 you're better off and more competitive. So it was really great to pull that together in a book, and I did that as part of teaching it at the University of Washington. I taught the class before writing it, and then stepped, uh, stepped back from teaching in order to get it written and published and out there. And then, and then when it came out, they invited me back, and this is in the communications department. So it's been great fellowship and, and really wonderful to kind of talk about it and, and meet with new minds and, and minds I've known for a long time over it. Well, uh, you're probably involved in a lot of different activities. Uh, is there anything uh, new and exciting going on that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, uh, the teaching is, is, is now, um, you know, a big part of my winters. Uh, you know, in between, um, again, I'm a social psychologist by training, so it's not completely cognitive and everything. But uh, I, I'm a rabid, uh, you know, reader of, of, of things in behavioral economics and things in neuroscience. And then one of the kind of odd ways that I sort of apply that is that I do manage a community club in, in Kenmore, which is where I live, and I hope some Kenmore people come out to the conference. But it's just, it's just I don't know, it's just ways to, ways to really get with the people and really understand just how people live. I have an endless fascination for that. Well, let's talk about your... Uh a uh, topic which uh, spans a lot of the different uh, things in your background and your work that you uh, talked about, but the uh, title of your topic is The Ethics of Behavioral Design. So uh, give us a little sense of uh, 
where that topic sprung from and what we can expect to learn from it. Well, you know, a lot of the people who are attending the conference are probably familiar with behavioral design, and 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 we're going to start the the talk uh, talking about the the famous B. J. Fogg Stanford class that produced uh, folks who who were really tuned to psychological processes and ended up, you know, founding Instagram and ended up really retooling Facebook like button and Uber, and and the success of that. They now call it the Stanford Facebook class. It's kind of where we'll start. And, and what I've sort of found is, you know, those moments of truth, those bottlenecks that I was just listing, they also, um, working with my students, give us a framework to understand what is good design and what is design that goes too far. And so um, in the last year, I've been speaking a lot on the notion that if you're too aggressive at trying to get attention, or if you're too aggressive at trying to get engagement, and you go over the line to something that maybe is a little bit distracting, right, or a little bit dependency forming, then what happens to users? And do they eventually, uh, you know, catch you up in a later bottleneck where they say, this isn't what my life is about and this isn't where I'm going. So we're going to outline some of those really kind of key moments of truth. I really am glad that my students, you know, and I tried to push forward out of just the psychology of UX because we've really found that, you know, the same human nature is applicable in voice design and interaction design. And we're finding, and, and, and I've given this talk a couple of times and refined it over the last eight months, that we're finding that it also gives a, a really, not, not, not a moralistic way to understand the ethics of design, but a way that, that basically teaches us that good design is good business, as it's always been. And so that's the kind of things we're going to talk about in the talk with a lot of examples. Hey, um, have you uh, had any feedback uh, from your work in this area as to uh, you know how it aligns with maybe things uh, going on at uh, Microsoft or at at other organizations? Uh, and uh, and or where do you see uh, your your research and these ideas uh, moving forward in the future? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. Next week here on the Microsoft campus, I'll, I'll not be talking about the ethics issue, but really applying this to things like conversion funnels um, to a group of, of 300 and, and, and Microsoft bought 150 books. Unfortunately, I don't get any royalties on those, but that's all right. I've got a great job. But um, when you think about when you're asked, the question is a great one, Joe, this stuff is always designed to give people new ideas, right? And one of the, one of the areas that's really fruitful is there's a lot of A-B testing that's going on, and Microsoft is really finally, you know, caught up and is really now leading on that kind of thing. And then when we're testing different designs, we're also now really interested in that variable lifetime value, and LTV is something that a lot of people are talking about as an important dependent variable when you're doing your, your you know, your multivariate A-B testing. And so one of the things I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll talk about is, and, and, and one of the things that I'm really working on now is, taking a psychological theory to inform a good A-B test and then looking how it ultimately affects lifetime value with a customer. And this is the way actually that we can be effective, but lifetime value is a great, very holistic metric because it means that you're not going to take advantage of just people's eyeballs, you know, without thinking about the whole person, the whole customer. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm going uh, in, in modern, um, you know, right now. In, my, in the conversations I'm having right now, and, and, and it's super interactive. Well, there's a lot of great ideas in there that I'm sure it's going to be fun for uh, everybody to consume and then uh, talk about it as part of the conference. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with me a little bit for this preview, and uh, we'll look forward in it, uh, seeing you at the event in March. Great, Joe. I hope everybody comes out. But, and I know everybody appreciates the work you do in setting this all up. It's going to be a great conference.